All right, so for the, the last bit of my talk, I'm going to be talking about cytokines and inflammation. I sort of started there, and I'm going to end there. Because it's not just oxidative stress that we can target, but we can target cytokines. So I, I think most people are now comfortable with the idea that in depression you've got inflammation. And this inflammation has a number of very important effects on neuronal biology. It decreases neurotransmitter metabolism. It decreases neurogenesis. It increases glutamate, glutamate excitotoxicity. So, you know, when I'm talking about glutamate excitotoxicity, the, we talk about inflammation, oxidative stress, and glutamate as if they're independent. They really aren't. All of these pathways are co-segregated. They're running together. And generally, dysregulation in one pathway spills over into dysregulation of another. This alters the neurocircuitry. And this can lead to depression. Again, my question is, that's all really cute and cuddly. Is this a druggable target? Uh, so I just wanted to show you this paper, which is probably the best evidence to date that people who have depression have markedly elevated inflammation. So this was only published last week. Again, a very rapidly moving field. So this is using a brain imaging marker called translocator protein density. So it's a marker of neuroinflammation. And they're looking at multiple different areas of the brain, the hippocampus, thalamus, striatum. And just look at the, the, the red bars. So whether you're looking at the prefrontal cortex, anterosingulate, in every one of these brain areas, you've got higher levels of inflammation than you have in control subjects. So this is the best evidence we've had to date that in the brains of people who are depressed, not just in the periphery, there's markedly elevated levels of inflammation. Not only is inflammation present in people who are depressed, but inflammation is a risk for depression. So I started off by saying that how all the bad things that we do, not eating well, not getting exercise, being obese, being stressed, being bullied, etc., lead to inflammation. This inflammation leads to depression. So in this study, we took a cohort of women who had never before been depressed. We measured their C-reactive protein, followed them for 10 years. And what you can see, the women in the black curve who had the lowest cytokines, the women in the red who had intermediate levels of cytokines, and the women in the green who had the highest levels of cytokines, the women who had the highest cytokines had the highest risk of developing a first episode of depression. So these are women who'd never before had any psychiatric problems. Information is a biomarker of risk. This predicts your vulnerability of developing depression. So I'll be talking in a moment about whether we can do anything about it. So for those of us who are jobbing clinicians who try to fix people, can we address this? The best studied treatment to date is celecoxib. So this is good old fashioned your grandmother's knee medication. Uh, and the fact that your granny's knee med might be able to fix depression comes as quite a surprise to many people. But the answer is a resounding probably. So if you look at the studies that have been done to date, so there's now four studies, you can see meta-analysis level of evidence that celecoxib might be useful for treating depression. Um, now, celecoxib is not an agent that is the most tolerable medicine we have. It's used for chronically for arthritis, but it does have its risk. But nevertheless, theoretically and even practically, I think this is a finding of considerable importance. And I want to show you this study, too. I was absolutely blown away when I saw the study. This is a study of celecoxib in autism. Now, those of you who know the autism treatment literature would know that there is close to nothing that reduces the core symptoms of autism. There are no useful pharmacotherapies for autism, except this one. So here, they looked at the same checklist that we, that we spoke about in the NAC studies. And here you can see robust reduction in the irritability, social withdrawal, and stereotypic behavior in autism. Um, NAC only reduced irritability had no f impact on social withdrawal and no impact on stereotypic behavior. But just look at these error bars. These are really wide error bars. It's one study. It's not replicated. Silicoxib in kids' safety record is uncertain. 
So I'm not, nobody's telling you to go and put everybody with autism on celecoxib yet. However, this is a very, very interesting and promising finding. It needs to be replicated, and I have no doubt somebody's going to do it. But that's not all. There are other anti-inflammatory agents. So pioglitazone, somebody might, some of you might know it. It's an anti-diabetic drug. It's got really robust anti-inflammatory properties as well. And here's a study, like the previous one, comes out of Iran. Let me tell you, some of the most interesting studies in this whole area are being done in Iran at the moment. Tehran is an absolute hotbed of psychopharmacology. Some of the most interesting studies are coming out of there. So this is another Iranian study. Here you can see pioglitazone compared to placebo. Pioglitazone beats placebo. And then these guys did something even more interesting. They asked the question, well, maybe this has got nothing to do with the fact that pioglitazone is anti-inflammatory. Maybe it's just because it's an insulin sensitizer. And maybe this has all got to do with glucose and insulin. So let's compare pioglitazone to an anti-diabetic drug that's not anti-inflammatory, like metformin. And that's what they did. So here you can see in the top is metformin, and the bottom is pioglitazone, and pioglitazone smokes metformin in depression. Very nice, sophisticated study. Again, it needs to be replicated, but um, a very interesting study at all. The, the, the problem is, for us jobbing clinicians, that metformin is reasonably tolerable, and pioglitazone is much less tolerable. So I'm not, whether we can translate this into routine care remains uncertain. And then this paper came out in 2010. So it's now not a, not a new paper, but I was, apps, you know, there's not a lot of papers that you look at and you say, wow, this is interesting. This is a wow paper for me. Aspirin in schizophrenia. OK, let me just derail for one second. Bloody aspirin. After 150 years of medicine, if we, there was one drug that we thought we were on top of that we could close the book on, it would be aspirin. I mean, for God's sake. Uh, we've, aspirin's about the oldest drug we have in medicine. If we th uh, and we really thought that we understood what aspirin did and what its potential was. But the answer is, we clearly don't yet. Um, so the fact that aspirin, 150 years later, is one of the most interesting drugs in psychiatry uh, is kind of just a, a salutary lesson as to how uncertain and how fragile the field is. So the sample size was not great. It was under 100 people. It wasn't positive on anything, on everything. But here you can see um, on total PANS uh, and on particularly on negative symptoms. Uh, this is general, and this is negative symptoms of PANS. Not at all time points, but at some time points. But just the fact that aspirin might be useful for schizophrenia is, I think, a fascinating finding in its own right. What about depression? Well, there's one paper by Osvaldo Almeida from Western Australia. It's not a clinical trial. It's a pharmacoepidemiology study. So what they do there is they look in an epidemiological cohort as who's depressed, who's taking aspirin, and see if there's any interaction. And the bottom line, what he found is that aspirin on its own didn't do much. But if you had high homocysteine and you were taking aspirin, you had a lower risk of developing depression, which is a very interesting finding. Um, I'm going to come back to this point in a moment, and that's the point of biomarker stratification. In other words, it may be that you have to have a biomarker that's abnormal in order to give an anti-inflammatory agent. In other words, if you give an anti-inflammatory agent to somebody who doesn't have inflammation, it might be completely useless. And I'll show you some data that says that that might indeed be the case. But Osvaldo's paper is the first to suggest that that might actually be the case. And then this paper came along. Out of left field, I mean, this is seriously out of left field. Aspirin for the treatment of lithium-induced sexual dysfunction. Uh, you and I would know how many effective treatments we've got for sexual dysfunction. Uh, not a lot. Well, the other curiosity is why they looked at lithium. Because uh, to me, anti if you're going to study sexual dysfunction, you look at SSRIs, look at antipsychotics. Why lithium? But they chose lithium. And here you can see on all four measures of function, uh, total international er index for erectile function, erectile domain scores, orgasmic function, 
intercourse satisfaction scores, lithium uh, um, aspirin's better than placebo. So aspirin might reverse sexual dysfunction. Well, where does this come from and how do we use this? I think we don't know yet. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, it's, not a ma it's rare, it's not a major side effect of lithium, but this is what they did. It's not, lithium is not a major cause of sexual dysfunction, which is, again, curious why they chose lithium. They didn't explain in the paper, and I read that paper multiple times, why the hell choose lithium? Try Prozac, but no, they didn't want to look at Prozac. They didn't want to look at lithium. And hey. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the beauty and the peril of research. You've got creativity. You, know, you can come up with great ideas and bad ideas. Yeah. Function, and your aspirin may affect your Yeah. Okay, and that may be what's going on. That's what they discussed. Now you're absolutely you're spot on. You're completely spot on. That's exactly the hypothesis they had. Yeah. So what else could aspirin do? I mean, aspirin, really, the drug that we thought we, we got sorted a long time ago. See, here comes a study a couple of years ago. Aspirin in the prevention of cognitive decline. Not a randomized controlled trial. It's a five-year follow-up study of a non-demented population in Sweden. And they followed up people who had uh, no aspirin. That's 338 people. And you can see a decline of one point on the mini-mental. And in the aspirin group, you see no change over five years. So this raises the intriguing possibility that aspirin might be able to prevent dementia. Um, how neat would that be? The good news is that right here in Melbourne, and I'll show you the study in a moment, we'll be able to prove this definitively. And that's this study, the Esprit study. Anybody heard of the Esprit study? It's probably the biggest and best study being conducted in Australia, full stop at the moment. One of the most important studies. The lead investigator is John McNeil from Monash. Um, so it's the effects of aspirin on healthy lifespan. So it's looking at elderly people. Uh, anybody who's over the age of 70, who's kind of healthy, randomized, double-blind to aspirin or placebo, baby aspirin, 100 milligrams, five-year follow-up. So this study says it's aiming to recruit 19,000 healthy participants. I will tell you that it has already recruited 19,500 participants. So this is a $55 million study <laughs> jointly funded by the NIH in America and the NIH and MRC. And they're looking at a number of follow-ups. The primary endpoints in the study is, does aspirin prevent dementia, stroke, heart disease, cancer, diabetes? And five years ago, when I heard they were planning the study, um, I went to them, cap in hand, on my knees, and I said, please, 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 please put a, a depression endpoint in. And they said, yes. We put in a grant, got it funded. So we're going to be able to decide does aspirin reduce the risk for depression? So this is going to be the biggest study ever done in psychiatry by a factor of about 10. Uh, and not only can we see whether aspirin reduces the risk of depression, because 10% of the population are depressed at any point in time, we can take that 10%, follow them for a year, and see does aspirin treat depression in the end of the day? Because then we'll have a little randomized control trial of 2,000 people. And then, because we're measuring biomarkers, we can see do these biomarkers predict depression risk? And we can then also see, does aspirin affect these biomarkers? And we can also see, do these biomarkers correlate with the efficacy of aspirin? So this is going to be the most fabulous study. As I said, we've only finished recruitment. There's another five years to go until the people are followed up. So I look forward to coming back to Neil in 20, blah, what's the date? 2019, and we'll talk about the results.